Hello, I'm Jeffrey Tucker, Liberty.me. It's nice to be here with you tonight, and I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Jason Stapleton. Uh, Jason, it's a pleasure. This is our first time I meet. I'm an admirer of yours, so thank you for joining me. <laughs> oh, stop it. You are not. Uh, but no, I, I'm very excited to have this uh, discussion with you. I've, I've been a, a reader of yours for a long time. I've watched a lot of the stuff that you put out. I, I absolutely love, uh, love what you're doing, and, and I'm really... I'm I'm very grateful to be here with you tonight. So thank you very much for having me. Well, it's an exciting. It's been an exciting week, right? I mean, we 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 uh, started with a with a with a great great crash, and you know, it reversed itself. And um, you know, I, I've been getting a lot of calls from the press, you know, to explain what's going on. It does seem like everybody's looking for answers, doesn't it? Uh, well, yeah. Every time, every time something falls or looks like it's going to fall apart, everybody wants to find uh, wants to find out what the causation was, so that they can they can hopefully take advantage of it the next time that they see it. And and what you what you tend to see is a lot of people who just come up with stuff. They're just like, well, I I, I don't know, but uh, you, you know, China dropped first, so maybe it was China, or 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 maybe it's the Fed. Maybe they're afraid that the Fed's finally going to raise interest rates, and and they try and they try and put a label on it. And uh, and most of the time it's it's just sentiment. Sentiment changes. Uh, you know, you can look around the economy right now. You can look around the systemic problems that we have from uh, what the Federal Reserve is doing all the way down to what's happening in international markets, and you can see that the thing's broken. But until sentiment changes, uh, these things can perpetuate themselves for years or decades. So mm. yeah, it's all it all has to do with the perceptions about what other people are perceiving. That's a that's a complicated topic. Well, it's one of the things that that we've been talking about on the show recently is uh, is ha has to do with this idea of sentiment, and the idea that that markets are are not really fundamentally driven. We we like to pretend that they're fundamentally driven, but if they were really fundamentally driven, then we would look out and we would say, well, what we've got the the debt that we've incurred, the the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet from 800 million to four trillion dollars. That's not sustainable. That that's not healthy, and everyone would be running for the hills. But nobody's running for the hills. They're looking at this correction as a as a as a minor correction, and it may very well be. We don't know. Uh, but the truth is that it has entirely to do with sentiment. What the market, when the market is really a collection of individuals, how individuals feel about society, about the economy, about uh, where we're going, and as long as people still feel okay about it. Uh, then we continue to go up, but I think what the what we saw in what we saw this week was sentiment changed. People said, "Ah, well, maybe maybe things aren't really as good as we thought they were," and you saw a blip. Now, does that continue lower, or we were up 600 points today? Do we see a rally back up to 18,000? Um, nobody knows the answer to that, but fundamentally, it's it's wrecked. Yeah, that, this is the problem. I mean, essentially, for six years now, we've been sort of running on fumes um, or, or, or you know, phony money, the, the zombie banks, and 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 fake prosperity at some level. I mean, uh, which is not to say that it's a hundred percent fake. There is real prosperity. There's real things going on, but the injections by the Fed and the zero interest rate policy have to have an effect, and it's it's ultimately unsustainable. Don't you think? Well, yeah, absolutely. One of the you actually, um, hang on a minute. You wrote you wrote a paper recently for Fee, which is incredible, and, and I have it here. Um, <laughs> Fee's an incredible organization. This was a very good paper, um, you. and you said something. You were talking about uh, uh, the book. It was Prosperity and Depression, I think. Yeah, Gottfried Hobbler, nineteen. Yes, yeah, 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 and, and you quote him in here, and you say, Hubbler is careful to say that there is not likely one explanation for that applies in all cycles, in all times, in all places. There are far too many factors at work in a real world to provide such an explanation, and no author has even attempted to provide one. That is a, uh, from, for, I, I've been in the, in the financial markets for, for 10 plus years now. That is, uh, that's an incredibly uh, intuitive statement to, to, to make. Because the truth is that everyone tries to put a label on it. They try and say it was this or it was that. And, and there's no question that, uh, that all of that contributed to it. It was right. the reduction in China's growth. You know, it, estimates put China's growth somewhere between 3% and 7%. And we were hearing from the analysts, from the experts for years, that oh, we might see a decline from double digits, but 8% return is what we should expect year over year from China. And you're looking at that now, and you're saying, "Well, that, that's not possible. It, it's there's no way they're running that that high, and they've had a, a what now a 50% decline in their in their equity markets." And you look at this stuff, 
stuff and you say, well, yeah, it could have been China. It can also be the Fed and the expansion of their balance sheet. I think because of the way the Fed expanded their, their balance sheet, and I don't know how much you want to get into the weeds on this, I think what you've seen is an equity bubble and a bond bubble. You have not seen consumer price inflation in, that that everyone was predicting. You weren't seeing gold in. You haven't seen gold go through the roof like a lot of guys were predicting. You haven't seen the dollar get vaporized the way you expected it. Uh, doesn't mean that's not going to happen. But the way the Federal Reserve decided to expand its balance sheet to inject liquidity, it didn't make it to the consumer. So consumers didn't start spending, which means velocity of money didn't pick up, which means that right. we didn't get the massive uh, expansion in the monetary supply that, that a lot of the, uh, I guess, the doomsdayers were, were suggesting. doesn't mean it won't happen. It just hasn't happened yet. Uh, Jason, I, you know, I, I totally understand what you're saying, and I'm glad you're saying it because this is a very difficult thing for people to understand. I mean, I think it was in 2009... I gave a speech, which you can Google up on um, uh, on YouTube, in which I I predicted, you know, a kind of a coming hyperinflation based on on balance sheets of, of of banks, you know, just purely looking at Fed injections. And I look back at that now, and it's like, where where did I go wrong? You know, where where was I so wrong? And you only need to look at the velocity of money and and see where things. Uh, you know, went went a different direction than I expected, and what that means is the demand for for cash balances just went through the roof. Yes. And so, insofar as that's true, you're not going to generate the hot money on the street that is yeah, and to create that inflation that you would otherwise expect. In fact, we've seen the opposite: a, a sort of price pressure down. You've seen you've seen a deflationary pressure, yeah. And um, and for anybody who doesn't really understand what what that means, basically inflation is a byproduct of of really two things: the number of dollars in circulation and how quickly those dollars change hands or or the velocity of money. And so what happened when the Fed decided? Everyone kind of envisioned that when the Fed would start its quantitative easing program, that it would uh, it would take capital and it would just put it directly into the economy. But the Fed doesn't really like to do that because it understands what is likely to occur. Once that dollar leaves the Fed's hand and it goes into your hand, all of a sudden they can't control it anymore. And so one of the, what they did was they digitally expanded their balance sheet. They bought bonds, which they could easily get rid of. They, they simply made computer corrections inside of all of these banks that were uh, fundamentally unsound. And they said, well, okay, we'll loan you money at 0% interest rate so you can reconstitute your balance sheets so that you're structurally sound now and then we'll pay you to keep though that money on the books is what they decided to do so since they didn't take that money and hand it to somebody in the form of a loan or in the form of just a direct handout you didn't see that the velocity of money pick up and what you did see was bond prices uh... went up you, you saw a uh, yields go down which means that bond prices more people wanted bonds so interest rates went down so now you've got two percent interest rates on a ten-year mortgage or a ten-year bond and then the other thing you saw was when no one had, uh, when you weren't getting any yield in the in the bond market, people said, "Well, I'll go buy stocks with it because right. I've got to get yield somewhere. I've got to get a return, and two percent barely covers inflation." So I, they forced themselves into the equities market. So now you have uh, what what one could call inflation in the equity market and inflation in the bond market. And at some point, those will pop just like the housing market did. It's just a question of when. Let me ask you this. Um, you were there in 2008. I mean, I suppose you were early in your career. But did you anticipate the way this would all play out? I mean, it's been for me, it's been very educational and, and instructive, you know, to, just to see the way the Fed works with the banking system, works with the macroeconomic structures in the securities markets, and, and to see that interplay. In retrospect, it all seems very obvious to me, but clearly it was not because I, I didn't anticipate the way it would play itself out. No, you, you know, I, I did. I, I was watching it. I was I was a trading currencies at the time, and uh, it was it was early on when I was trading, and um, I didn't realize how bad it was until Bear Stearns failed, and when Bear Stearns failed, I, I, I they they allowed them to go under. I realized no, this is this is very serious, and then I started to do a little bit of research and and a lot of reading. And um, we started learning about credit default swaps, and started r started to realize how much money was really out there. And I said, No, no, this is this is a catastrophe. Um, but like you said, I can look back now, and I, I I can see it so clearly. And it's like, Well, how did how come you didn't know it at the time? 
And uh, and I don't think a lot of people knew about it at the time. You well, I don't look think at we, we anticipated the change in money demand. I mean, that was that was a big deal. The, the shift in velocity is the least cited statistic on the St. Louis Fed's uh, uh, statistical page, right? But it's right. the most significant in terms of understanding uh, price movements, it seems to me. I mean, in other words, it's consumer behavior. I mean, the, the way the public reacted to that crisis, which, by the way, is very similar to the way people reacted after the uh, stock market crash of 1929. Uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a risk aversion overtook uh, the public, just on the margin, enough to keep um, the banking system from becoming a kind of a generator of massive hot money on the street, as I said. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, you're absolutely right. And, and I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, one of the things, in 2005 and 2006, you started to see the same kind of fracturing that you're seeing now where we were having these 500-point down days and 300-point up days, these mm. big swings in the market. Now, that was 05 and 06. The stock market crashed. The collapse didn't happen until the end of 7, 08, right? right? So you're talking about, and that's what I was telling everyone to, uh, over the last couple of days. I said, we're seeing that fracturing happening now. You saw the same thing happen in the stock market and, and where we started to hit a, 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 a peak that the market just couldn't get over. And then we finally saw the collapse something two years later after we initially saw the cracks. And what I think is happening, and, and again, I, my, my perspective may change on this as, as time goes by, but I think we're starting to see that cracking. And it doesn't mean that uh, some sort of major financial collapse is going to happen next week or next month, but what it means is um, there, there is this, the structural problems are starting to show. Well, you know, do you remember, I mean, I was, so, I was so intrigued as I look back at it. Do you remember what it was like to be around in, in uh, the, the, the sort of the, the winter of 2007, the spring of 2008, even the summer of 2008? There was a, the, the reality of what was happening was sort of gradual. You know, I mean, it was sort of dawning on people. You could kind of sort of discern it. You had a, a feeling of insecurity and, you know, um, but you didn't know how far it was going to go. And there was a, you know, by December of 2008, of course, even by October, it was clear that we were living in a, in a major calamity. You know, it yeah. was a, a major, but the outlines of, of what was actually happening didn't, weren't drawn in sort of clear ink, you know, until, until about the fall. At least well, what were, well, I was going to say, what were you thinking at the time? What, what were, because uh, you're, you're in, a, in a very academic circle. Yeah. Um, I was I was definitely not in that circle. So as you guys were discussing what you were seeing um, and what you were hearing coming out of Wall Street and coming out of the Fed, uh, were, it sounds like you guys were looking for a a, a, a hot money and just uh, and were you looking well, at deflation? Were you were well, you thinking the that? First place, you know, I've you know I've lived in, in a world of, of of Austrian economists, right? So, and we had differences among ourselves going into the fall because, for one thing, I didn't know to what extent the housing price boom was was truly unsustainable. I mean, it was a little unclear how the government would treat Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and and the mortgage. Uh, back uh, securities industry generally, would it treat it as too big to fail? You know, what would be the Fed response? Um, uh, well, to what contribution did the perception that the Fed was going to bail out the thing uh, make to the housing bubble? That was already a contentious issue. So when it became clear that housing prices were collapsing and the, and the whole industry was, was, uh, was falling apart, then the question was, what was the Fed going to do? So when the Fed injected massive amounts of money, basically to sustain, as you said, the balance sheets of, of the banking industry, um, I would say the universal perception among the monetary economists I knew was that this was, near universal, was that this was a calamity that was going to lead to hyperinflation. And that was turned out to be dreadfully wrong because none of us had anticipated the uh, change in velocity. You know? Well, so let me ask, where do you think, what was the mistake? If, if you're looking back now and you're saying, all right, where, where was the error in the judgment? Yeah, the error in the judgment was not understanding the institutional complications of, of the inflationary process, actually. And uh, just not understanding that a lot of, you know, whether or not uh, there's money to burn out there, whether or not uh, there's real money creation, not just fake balance sheet, you know, papering over, over, um, uh, over bankruptcies, whether or not that could really occur really came down to the loan market. So it was a failure, I think, on my part and on the, on the part of many others to to fully understand the intricacies of the banking industry, actually. 
Um, and there was a real shift in, in velocity, which none of us had, had really anticipated, really. And that's what changed the whole character of, of everything. That's why so many Austrians were predicting hyperinflation that didn't mm -hmm. actually occur. You know, well, so, not so, all Austrians were, but so, m yeah. most of us were, and and we were just. I think it's just important to just admit that we were we were completely wrong on this. Um, which is not to say that the the Fed policies were were good. You know, yeah. they, you know, they created exactly the effects that you you just described. I mean, this this ridiculous boom in both uh, securities markets and 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 bond prices and and the bond market. That's the effect. Well, you, got, you did get the inflation. You, know, you, were, you guys yeah. were right about the inflation, just wrong about the, the area. And I don't think anybody, anybody who was looking at it in the beginning, um, it, you know, it's not like you guys got it wrong and everybody else got it right. No one, no one really understood oh. it. And, right. and so that, that kind of leads me to my next question is, and I, I don't mean to take over the interview, but I want to ask mm. you some of this stuff. Um, what do you, how are you guys looking at it now? So, so now you're in a situation where we're seven years into a into a into a a booming stock market. You've got what can only be described as bubbles, both in the bond and equity markets. You've got near zero percent interest rates, and it's there's a high likelihood that we are going to see cyclically another recession, even if nothing else causes it. Every Seven That's to right. ten years, we're going to see that. So, you know what's going what's yeah. to be their next move? What, and here, what's and the here's, Fed do now? Well, and and Jason, let me just highlight one of the tragedies here. Okay, uh, between two thousand eight and and now, we have seen very lackluster growth in the midst of the greatest technological revolution, arguably in the history of the world. You know, the last time we had anything remotely resembling this was in the Gilded Age, when we saw uh, economic growth take off, you know, uh, in double digits. And now we're barely uh, crawling by. Um, it's, it's a tragedy, and so a lot of the cost of what the Fed did in 2008 is opportunity costs. Mm -hmm. it's the cost of the growth that we would have seen between, say, 2010 and 2015 that we never saw because we never saw uh, the markets clear properly, essentially. There's right. that. Um, in terms of uh, the Fed's activities now, I, I think we've learned something about the Federal Reserve in 2008, right? They have this dual mandate about unemployment and, and inflation. Ultimately, this is just a, a public, uh, P, it's just PR, right? And what the Fed is there to do is to support its member banks and their liquidity. That's its job. Everything else just is is secondary and just you know the stuff that they feed financial journalists you know, so that's the number one thing and that's what they're going to be uh, focused on. That's yeah. that's in the next crisis. It's 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 all about surviving. That's the rule. One of the things that I got wrong um, that I, I really thought I was I I, th I thought I'd really nailed this one was I thought that what we would see was after the banks recon after the Federal Fed reconstituted the banks balance sheets and they were stable they gotten all this free money or nearly free money I thought well now what they need to do is they they just need they need to loan so I thought that what we would see was interest rates would go up we would see interest rates rise to a point where the banks would actually feel like they wanted to make loans and we'd feel a little bit of pain but then we would we would return to uh, you know we would return to a I guess what you would consider a more normal market we don't really have free markets anymore but a more normal market and it just didn't happen we we didn't see interest rates come up I I mean the the Fed seems to be artificially keeping interest rates near zero um, waiting for some sort of pop for us to come out of this malaise but there's nothing there uh, there, there's no growth, like you said. They, they've, they've sucked all of the opportunity out of the out of the economy, and I just uh, I'm I'm dreadfully afraid that we're going to see something similar to negative interest rates, or just simply what we'll see is the 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 Fed will continue, will set up some sort of special bond program just for the federal government, and then it will raise interest rates on everybody else. I can see something like that happening too, and it it makes me nervous. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, the the problem you're drawing attention to is the fact that there's nowhere else to move. You know, yeah. the Fed has done everything that it can do at this point, and as far as I can tell, we have nowhere else to go. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about Japan in the 1980s, right? That's yep. a, 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 a in the 1990s. I mean, it's a similar situation. I mean, they've tried every Keynesian policy prescription they know. Uh, they've used every weapon they have. And and now they're out. So this is what makes me nervous of a of a kind of a Peter Schiff sort of scenario. Um, you know, in a, in a way, 
their strategy worked in 2008 because there there was move there was there was room you know there was yeah they had space they had space to work yeah yeah and but, they don't have now, that anymore but now what what are they you know where, where does it go I don't know I mean if the, if the dollar were not the world reserve currency I mean I I don't even know yeah the U S would be in a, in a, a great depression a long time ago yeah so well, who knows what happens in terms of the dollars. Uh, value um, and you know there's also the fact that the U.S. is losing its position as an economic uh, as the world superpower economically. I mean that that seems to be happening. And in fact, if it hadn't been for the recent uh, macroeconomic instability in China, if you could forecast five years from now and see that U.S. would have been you know down the list in terms of China. Yeah, um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see uh, to see how how we handle the the next downturn. I I'm not. I'm not as concerned about America losing superpower status or, or even the effect that, that uh, losing reserve currency status would have on the dollar. I know a lot of people are really afraid of that. Um, I, I'm concerned less about that. I mean, you can look at our dollar relative to the pound or the euro, or, uh, and, and those, those currencies still trade at a premium to the dollar, and they're yeah. not reserve currency. So I mean, at the end of the day, it's all fiat money, and really, people put a value on it based on what, how secure they feel like it is. And so, whether the dollar loses its reserve currency status, I'm just, I may be totally wrong. I just don't, I don't see it having the dramatic effect that a lot of people think it's going to have. Just simply because, again, I, I'm just always of the belief that markets are sentiment driven. Um, yeah. That the reality of the situation is not necessarily uh, is not necessarily what drives prices. Well, I you know I'm, I'm glad you drew attention to that article I wrote. I mean this is this is covering a book from 1940 36-41, uh, two editions by Gottfried Hobler, where he goes over all the prevailing business cycle theories at the time, including the Keynesian one, which was not that big a deal at the time, as as remarkable as it seems. But yeah, one of the you know he he talks about over um, over investment theories, uh, monetary theories. Uh, he even throws in agricultural theories and and exogenous shock theories, uh, psychological uh, theories. And I I liked his breakdown because it's true that in a way um, he sort of siloed these theories, you know, just so we could focus on them and think about them as as independent causes. But in the end, he concludes that that all these factors. Uh, are infinitely complex and play into each other, and I think that's what we're seeing here right now. I mean, the psychology, market psychology, works with monetary factors, works with the overinvestment and uh, and and um, you know exogenous shocks. You know, er everything plays together. Uh, no, you're exactly right. I, I was listening to Peter Schiff talk uh, the other day, and 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 he was uh, he was talking about oh, it's 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 the Fed. But they think that everybody's worried about China, but it's really the Fed. And and I I tend I tend to lean towards no it's it's both it's it's yeah. a combination of factors that cause people to uh, you know to weigh opportunity differently and so it's a combination of things coming together that ultimately cause uh, or, or create the causal factors that lead to market crashes or or inflation or you know you name it. Well, now you you've been you spent a lot of time in the markets. You understand consumer behavior. Um, what what are people inclined to do in light of present <clears throat> prevailing market trends that you think they probably shouldn't do? I mean, how how would you assess, you know, the 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 person on the street and and their response to the uh, existing um, financial news and the mistakes that people tend to make? Well, I think the, the the biggest mistake that people make is is they try and invest they they attempt to invest in in things that they don't understand. Uh, and they they don't try to understand them, so they might make money and it goes into a mutual fund or it goes to a money manager or it goes just into a 401k and they let somebody else decide what it's going to get invested in and then they're just subject to the whims of the market and hopefully the guy who's doing it performed well. Um, if if your audience wants to know how to get rich, it's a two stage process. Uh, the first thing is spend less than you make. That's <laughs> the number one. And then second is you invest what's left over in industries that you understand. And if you don't understand it, don't invest in it. And that's what I see more than anything is people coming in and, and trying to make decisions when they don't truly understand what they're doing. And if you, don't, if you don't care enough about your money to really learn how to invest it and learn about these things and, and how to read the income statements and balance sheets and how to read stock charts and those types of things, then turn it over to somebody else. Um, but I've always been one who said nobody cares more about my money than I do. 
and mm. I, I want to understand, even if I do turn over what I do to somebody else, um, I invest in businesses now, and I turn over a large percent of the operating uh, of that business to the owner of the business, mm. and I act more as a, as a funder than anything else. And one of the things that, uh, that I've just learned to do is um, I at least know enough to know when they're going wrong. And so if you're going to invest your money and you're going to give it to somebody else, at least know enough to know that when, uh, I, don't, I don't want to, I got in some trouble because I, I was kind of talking bad about Peter Schiff and people didn't like it. But my <laughs> point being is that know enough that when, when the guy is telling you to do X and you know it's not right, to say no, it's your money. And so that's, that's the one piece of advice that I would give is if you, if you don't care enough about your money, then give it to anybody. But if you do care, learn about it and invest in things you understand. Yeah, and that requires a certain conscientiousness and uh, uh, you know some some time investment, right? I mean, you have to you have to be able to focus and and yeah, actually care. But you would say personal financial management is actually probably more important than than investment overall. No, it really is. If you <laughs> you the people spend. It's funny because uh, Dave Ramsey. Uh, that, that's that two stage process on on how you become a millionaire. Uh, spend less than you earn, invest the rest. Uh, he talks about that three hours a day, every day on the radio. He's made it, you know, ten million, a ten million dollar a year business out of telling people spend less than you make, invest the rest. And if you can't, if you decide not to invest the rest, even if you put it in a in a baggie and bury it in the ground, you'll do better by just focusing on figuring out how to live within your means, which is something that everybody from Main Street to Wall Street has problems doing. Well, and it's not just that they have problems doing it. It's that the, the entire system seems to be designed to encourage you not to do that. <laughs> that's right? exactly right. Well, that's what the Fed's trying to do right now. They're trying their very best to get you to spend what little you have left in the hopes that, uh, that somehow your, your extra consumer spending is going to bring us out. And I, I cannot possibly believe, Jeffrey, that the people in charge running the Fed do not understand that it is production, not consumption, that drives the economies. I, I do not believe that they are that ignorant of economics, that they don't understand that what needs to happen is a reconstitution of, of savings so that that can be put to productive use and so that we can then get to a point where, where we increase uh, productivity and, and we can have growth, real growth. For some reason, we're stuck in this. How many times can you do the same thing over and over again and get the same response and, and just continue down this cycle of, oh, well, Keynes said every time we get a depression or, or a recession, we should just pump money into the economy. How long do we have to sit through that before people wake up and say, no, 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 that, that doesn't make sense? That's pretty awesome. I mean, almost every day in the New York Times, you can read Paul Krugman, you know, asserting oh, the same thing again and again, right? Oh, he makes, me, he makes me so angry. The man is not an economist. He's just not. He's a shill. He's a shill for left-wing progressive ideology. The man knows nothing. I, did, I didn't spend a day in college, all right? And I would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this guy on economics any day of the week. I just, I have no respect for him at all, none. The man is yeah. a total clown. Yeah, this, 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 this under-consumption under theory, which Hobbler talks about, you know, it was around back in the 30s and the 20s, you know. But, yeah. you know, and Hobbler, it's funny to read Hobbler from, from 1936, and the disdain with which he treats this theory is, is actually hilarious, you know. He just, as he, as he says, it's just anti-economics. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's just... Uh, how, how a man can be so consistently wrong on virtually every prediction that he makes and still be able to go and write it and write every single month for the I mean it's like the weatherman he's yeah. right less than the weatherman and they still let him stay on the air they still give him a place to write in their paper I just I yeah. I just I, I don't understand it I really don't well so here you have a system that seems to be designed to encourage everybody to borrow as much as possible every, I mean the whole structure of the Federal Reserve these days is is encouraging people to live beyond their means I mean that seems yeah. to be the idea. And who wins from the system, ultimately? I mean, who, who benefits from people's individual financial mistakes? It's, it's, it's the, the ruling class and the financial elite, essentially, yeah. right? No, I'm, I, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's just I mean, a big mess. Hey, can I, mean, I ask you something? Can I ask yeah. you something that's completely yeah. off, off subject? No, it's fine. Um, you're, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you're, you would fall into uh, the anarchist side of uh, of a political philosophy, yes? 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have. I, I am. I am not an anarchist. I would. I would consider myself an extremely limited government libertarian. Mm -hmm. um, for some. For a reason, I want to ask you about. Go ahead. How in a in an anarcho society can the individual protect himself against a nation state that seeks to overpower him and take what's rightfully his? Oh, you mean like a foreign invasion or something like yes, that? Yes, correct. So let's say that let's say that we had a, a, an anarchist society and we didn't have any centralized government. Let's say it was it was some other form of adjudicating uh, uh, you know violations of li uh, life, liberty, and property, and uh, all of a sudden a, a large nation state. Because prior, to, uh, here's the thing: prior to Napoleon, when you had small sectarian armies that would rally themselves together to have small skirmishes against one another over small pieces of property, I could understand the necessity not to have a standing army of some kind. But since Napoleon, we've seen a natural progression of larger and larger standing militaries. So what's to keep, in an, in an anarcho society, what's to keep some other nation like Canada just coming down here and saying, you know what, you're small, you're weak, you have no standing army, we're just going to take what belongs to you. Yeah, no, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I think we can actually reflect on many of the events of our own time to sort of understand the answer. If you don't have a nation state in place in your own domestic environment, there's nothing for any foreign invader to take over. What, um, about, res what about resources? Well, you know, that can only go so far. Um, you know, I, I like to think about the U.S. invasion of Af Afghanistan as a great example of this. Um, you remember when the U.S. invaded, um, the U.S. declared victory within about 24 hours because they said the Taliban had fled. And uh, the U.S., you know, occupied the capital and, and stood there, you know, um, acting as if they were the rulers. And here we are. How many years later is this now? A lot of years later. Many. Many years yeah. later, yeah. And the U.S. has, of course, less con less control than ever, and all the people the U.S. tries to put in, into into place, you know, don't control. And there is there is no control, um, you know, ultimately. And one of the reasons is that the government was was smart enough to disband itself. Actually, it's the best protection for any country for there not to be a government, because if there's no government, there's nothing to take over in the first place. And this is the great mistake I think that countries countries make. They they create governments and they make themselves vulnerable. If they never created a governments in the first place, um, then foreign foreign powers could, can show up. And yeah, I mean, uh, guerrilla armies have consistently beat nation state armies now for a very long time on the battlefield. And we've seen this in Iraq and Afghanistan and Somalia and everywhere else around the around the world. So I mean, you I know would that's, say it's that's very interesting that you say that. I, I go ahead, go ahead. No, it makes this, it makes a people vulnerable to create a government because then they, they always they, they create something that's always in, in danger of being taken over by 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 hostile um, by hostile forces. I mean, I would actually argue that all governments are hostile anyway. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> well, and that that and and see that that's that really is true. Is that it's you know who who do you want? You, there there is you can you you've always got a dictator. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I, it's interesting that you bring that up because I spent uh, about five years between Iraq and Afghanistan um, working in those countries uh, before I became a libertarian. Are you and, um, I mean, you were okay. actually in the service? No, I was in the military, uh, and then after that I worked for a private security company that wow. worked for the State Department. Okay. So I, uh, I was, uh, I was in charge. I was, I worked with uh, provincial reconstruction teams, uh, helping them build roads and bridges. I provided security to them for doing while they did that. Um, and uh, and you're right about the fact that uh, guerrilla armies. You cannot ever control land that a guerrilla decides or that a people don't where when a people don't want you there. No. They will always expel you. The, the fight will never be over. You will never gain control of them. They will just continue to battle you. Um, but you would have to admit that there is a massive amount of carnage and destruction of death that ensues um, w during that process. Uh, I, I guess I, 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 I always concern myself. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and yeah. I, always, I, always, I always said I, I'm in search of maximum liberty. Because I, yeah. I, I said if, if I decide that I don't want to be, I don't want to surround myself with anyone, I want to be totally indiv independent, um, and and not answer to anyone that lasts only as long as, until somebody bigger and stronger than me comes by to take what I have. 
True um, mm-hmm. And so I try and find this this area of what I call maximum liberty, which yeah. okay, how much how much security do we have to have in order to protect life, liberty, and property? And how best do we do we create that society? And I have been. That's why I wanted to ask you that question, and I was kind of excited to talk yeah, with yeah. you. But you know, because another I thing, wanted to know. Yeah, another thing to think about um, is that um, I don't know if you know about uh, Costa, Costa Rica. Have you ever been ever been to Costa Rica? I, ha- I have not. Yeah. You know, so they abolished their standing army. I don't know how long ago. Um, Twenty five years ago, or something like that. Thirty years ago, and the Costa Rica doesn't bother anybody. They just kind of do their own thing. They have no standing army. They have no military whatsoever, and 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 everybody leaves them alone. Uh, they don't they don't you know agitate any foreign nations. They don't um, they're not the target of any terrorist group anywhere uh, because they just don't mix it up in, in international affairs. And in a way, that's been beautiful for Costa Rican prosperity. I mean, it's it's you know, I guess probably the most prosperous country in, in, in Central America for that reason. And I think that, that the U.S. could learn a lesson from this, you know, so that even if you do have a government, um, it's a bad idea to have an imperial government that's, that's, that's you know, got bases in hundreds of countries around, the, you know, in every country in the world and, and mixing it up in, in uh, other people's business. You make yourself a target. I mean, I think we all sh- surely should recognize this by now, that this is a a mistaken uh, sort of foreign policy that it's well, I, I, safer for people just to, you know, just just to not have standing armies and just just to have be a commercial society that that trades with the world. You you and I are in total agreement on that. I I, uh, I cannot understand uh, American foreign policy. I you know we have this. Even I was listening to the presidential uh, discussion they were having the the whatever you call it the debate they were having. And a lot of these guys are using a standard of government need or, or uh, uh, the U.S. interests. Well, we we'll go to war for U.S. interest. And I've always believed, you know, you only fight when you have to preserve your own life, your own liberty, your own property, what's yours. You, you don't go because you have an interest. It's kind of like government need. The government will always find a need for what it wants. It will always find an interest when it wants to inject itself in, uh, in, in, a, in a specific part of the world. And so uh, after being in Iraq and Afghanistan for so many years, one of the things I realized was our foreign policies wrecked. You know, I worked closely with the State Department. It's just, it, it could, uh, people really don't realize how bad it is, how bad our foreign policy is, and how bad the decision makers are who are, who are driving the foreign policy. Uh, and we get accused a lot of being isolationists. And it's like, no, it's, it's not isolationism to say, we don't have any business with you. We don't want any trouble. We just want to live free and to leave people alone. And for some reason, we have a foreign policy that says, no, we've got to be injected in everybody's business. We've got to be you know, funneling money here or there, supporting this group or that group. We've got to pick a side in every single battle. And it's just it leads to the type of violence that we see today. Yeah, I think that's beautifully stated. I mean, that's certainly my impression. I was never in the military. I don't understand it. I have never seen it from the inside. But I do understand that government at all levels is, you know, basically a shit show. I mean, I know this. So it's got to be terrible on the international level. I can't even yeah. imagine. I can't even imagine the incoherence of the whole thing, which is why it worries me, um, you know, that you know every presidential candidate, as far as I know, is uh, promising to restore American greatness around the world by enhancing, you know, the military power, certainly among the Republicans and the Democrats too. You know, I mean, I, I don't understand it because, you know, um, you know, truly at the at the end of the Cold War, I thought that would be the end of it. I mean, I thought, okay, communism's out of the way. We're going to now mind our own business and and sort of fulfill this sort of Jeffersonian, Washingtonian foreign policy of just trading with people and. Um, and and not stirring up wars around the world, but that didn't that didn't happen. I mean, it was one of the great tragedies um, of my life, actually, to to experience what happened after the end of yeah. the Cold War. You know, it, we had a chance for peace, and I, I think it would have been a, a very beautiful thing. And imagine how much how much prosperity have we given up? You know, over the last uh, you know twenty five years. Uh, uh, yeah. Because of, because of the the failure to do that. I mean, it's it's awesome to think how much. How much prosperity we've we've relinquished, you know, to uh, U.S. foreign policy? No, how how much how much blood and coin we've spilled 
um, yeah. that, that didn't really protect anyone. That that was one of the things that that just baffled me. As you, you're driving around these cities in 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 Afghanistan and Kabul or in northern Iraq, and you're just going, "What are we even doing here?" You know, I just I just got back to the base, and 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 uh, and some uh, and a vehicle full of army guys got hit by an underground IED they planted in the ground, and, and killed like six of them. And what those guys die for? They didn't die for anything. They're just there driving around town. Where yeah. you accomplish nothing, and it just it it it's so frustrating to me to come back and then see our elected officials say, "No, what we need is more than that. More of that." We see guys yeah, like I, Lindsey Graham, um, who, who, who all he all he wants to do is just send more people to fight and and die for somebody else's freedom. I have a strong impression that this civilian political order in the U.S. is far more interventionist than the military itself. I mean, the, the military itself it seems to have a, 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 a greater understanding of the costs of these kinds of wars than, uh, than our politicians do. Would I you agree ones, with that? I think the ones who've been there, you're absolutely right. The guys, the guys who've been there, who, who've seen it, um, you know, and it's, it's not everybody. Some guys absolutely love war. Um, they, they love violence. That's where they want to live. Uh, and uh, and certainly in the military, that's something that they feed you and and they sell you from the day that you get in. And I'm not I don't want to knock the military or anybody in it because uh, I've got a lot of good friends who are still part of that. Um, but uh, and, and they care very deeply about their country and about liberty in general. But I, I will say that that's something that is you take a, a 17, 18, 19 year old kid and you tell him every day. Um, you know, that he's superhuman and, and he's going to go to war and he's going to serve his country and he's going to protect democracy and liberty around the world. And you pump that into him every single 365 days a year for a couple of years. And man, it's, it changes his perspective. And it takes going, going there and seeing it and realizing, man, you know what, we're not, there's no liberty getting spread here. There's no freedom and democracy. This is just government injecting itself into some somebody else's business, it's somebody else's war, and it's I'm just it's frustrating to me again to see the same thing perpetuated over and over and over again, and for nobody to stand up, nobody willing to say, look, it doesn't make me un-American to not want to send it's not to want to send our young boys off to die. That's not an un-American thing to do. It doesn't it doesn't make me a blame America firster. It's it just makes me it makes me rational. And it's just, it's frustrating. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off on it. You know, I think it's awesome. That's, uh, that was a very beautiful uh, statement. And I'm, I have the highest respect for you because you've been there, you've seen it. And, and therefore, it means a lot, a lot more to you than, than I, could ever, I could ever understand. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. I mean, um, you know, we're definitely at a turning point in our, in our country. And I'm just, I think it's tragic that your perspective is not held, which I, I've heard what you just said so many times from so many uh, of the uh, enlisted, you know. Um, they all say the same thing, and I, I think it's just appalling that our our domestic uh, uh, political uh, uh, figures, you know, are unwilling to vocalize what you just said. I mean, it's it's one of the great tragedies of our time. Yeah, yeah, it really, I'm, it, it is, it is. Jason, you, what have you got planned for Liberty Me? You got uh, you got some shows uh, coming up. Are you going to well, do some? We, we are starting a uh, we're starting a television network called sure. Liberty One TV. And what we're going to try, what we're doing is, uh, you can see I'm, I'm, I'm here in our studio uh, here in Kansas City. And I like what it. We're, nice. Yeah, thanks. And what we're attempting to do is we're attempting to create a space uh, full of video content that is dedicated to uh, advancing the concept and the ideas of individual liberty and economic freedom. And I'm, I'm, I'm relatively open. Um, I don't really, I'm, I'm not trying to you know, a position, a specific idea, idea or ideology, anarchism, uh, minarchism, you know, whatever the ism is that you want to promote, as long as it's pro-liberty and free markets, I'm interested in it. And yeah. what we're going to start doing is we're going to start by aggregating data and aggregating content. So I'm going to go out and find, uh, we're, we're doing stuff with you guys, partnering with you guys, partnering with, uh, uh, with Truth and Media, partnering with uh, Econ Stories, the guys over there uh, who just put out some really fantastic stuff. Yeah. Um, my show is going to be on there, and then uh, we're also working with uh, some guys that uh, like Free to Choose. Some of the Mises, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Some of the uh, uh, Friedman stuff is really good, and we'd like yeah. to include that to help people understand. 
uh, more about economics and, and politics. And so we're putting this stuff together and what we intend to do is then start creating our own content. So we'll start doing our own documentaries, um, our, our own educational pieces, all with the design of, of just advancing this idea of, of, of liberty and, and free markets. Oh, I just think that's really awesome. If you come through Atlanta, we'd love to hold an event with you. It, sounds, it just sounds fantastic. I, I'd love to bump into you at uh, SFL meetings or uh, free, uh, uh, Freedom Fest or any of the other things. So, Well, I'm, I'm, I'm scheduled to go to Freedom Fest. I've been debating whether or not I was actually going to go. I, I bought all the tickets months ago when I, when I heard it coming, when it was coming out. And uh, is, that's in October, right? Is that when it is? Well, no, I'm, I'm not that, sure. That's Liberty Fest in New York City. Yeah, no, Liberty Fest in New York City. Yeah, I'm going to be there. I'm speaking at Liberty Fest. And then there's, there's also a Libertopia in Los Angeles and then Freedom Fest in Las Vegas, which occurs, I guess, in July. So, all but, right. Yeah. Well, I got, I got I to pay some bills to cover all my massive overhead, so I can't make it to all of those. But I've been debating going to New York City, and, uh, and, and, and so I may see you there, and we ought, we ought to link up if I get oh, there. I'd like to do that. And, and, if, and if not, let's just hang out again uh, sometime soon online and talk about whatever's going on. Cause I, I would I, love it. Anytime you want to. I, I'm, I really appreciate you having me on. I, I love talking to you, and, and uh, I love what you guys have done at Liberty.me. I think it's fantastic. I've uh, been in the chats and, and listening to people and, and watching some of your content that you guys have been putting out. And it's just, it's just great. You guys are doing everything right. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to be working with you, and I look forward to visiting with you again real soon, Justin. Thanks, Jeffrey. Appreciate it. Bye. All right. Bye. So that they can, they can hopefully take advantage of it the next time that they see it. And, and what, you, what you tend to see is a lot of people who just come up with stuff. They're just like, well, I, I, I don't know, but uh, you, you know, China dropped first, so maybe it was China, or, or, or maybe it's the Fed. Maybe they're afraid that the Fed's finally going to raise interest rates, and, and, they try and they try and put a label on it. And, and most of the time, it's, it's just sentiment. Sentiment changes. Uh, you, know, you can look around the economy right now. You can look around the systemic problems that we have from uh, what the Federal Reserve is doing all the way down to what's happening in international markets, and you can see that the thing's broken. But until sentiment changes, uh, these things can perpetuate themselves for years or decades. So, mm. yeah, it's all it all has to do with the perceptions about what other people are perceiving. That's a that's a complicated topic. Well, it's one of the things that that we've been talking about on the show recently is uh, is ha has to do with this idea of sentiment and the idea that that markets are are not really fundamentally driven. We we like to present the answer to that, but fundamentally, it's it's wrecked. Yeah, that, this is the problem. I mean, essentially for six years now, we've been sort of running on fumes um, or, 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 you know, phony money, the zombie banks and, and, and fake prosperity at some level. I mean, uh, which is not to say that it's 100% fake. There is real prosperity. There's real things going on. But the injections by the Fed and the zero interest rate policy have to have an effect. And it's, it's ultimately unsustainable, don't you think? Well, yeah, absolutely. One of the you actually, um, hang on a minute. You wrote you wrote a paper recently for Fee, which is incredible, and, and I have it here. Um, <laughs> Fee's an incredible organization. This was a very good paper, um, you. and you said something. You were talking about uh, uh, the book. It was Prosperity and Depression, I think. Yeah, Gottfried Hobbler, nineteen six yes. nineteen forty one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you quote him in here, and you say, Hubbler is careful to say that there is not likely one explanation for that applies in all cycles, and all tend that they're fundamentally driven. But if they were really fundamentally driven, then we would look out and we would say, well, what we've got, the, the debt that we've incurred, the, the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet from $800 million to $4 trillion, that's not sustainable, that, that's not healthy, and everyone would be running for the hills. But nobody's running for the hills. They're looking at this correction as a, as a, as a minor correction, and it may very well be. We don't know. Uh, but the truth is that it has entirely to do with sentiment, what the market when the market is really a collection of individuals, how individuals feel about society, about the economy, about uh, where we're going. And as long as people still feel okay about it, uh, then we continue to go up. But I think what, the, what, we saw in, what we saw this week was sentiment changed. People said, ah, well, maybe, maybe things aren't really as good as we thought they were, and you saw a blip. Now, does that continue lower, or we were up 600 points today, do we see a rally back up to 18,000? Um, nobody knows. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Tucker, Liberty.me. It's nice to be here with you tonight, and I'm 
pleased to welcome my guest, Jason Stapleton. Uh, Jason, it's a pleasure. This is our first time I meet. I'm an admirer of yours, so thank you for joining me. <laughs> oh, stop it. You are not. Uh, but no, I, I'm very excited to have this uh, discussion with you. I've, I've been a, a reader of yours for a long time. I've watched a lot of the stuff that you've put out. I, I absolutely love, uh, love what you're doing, and, and I'm really... I'm I'm very grateful to be here with you tonight. So thank you very much for having me. Well, it's an exciting it's been an exciting week, right? I mean, we we, we uh, started with a with a with a great great crash, and you know it reversed itself. And um, you know I, I've been getting a lot of calls from the press, you know, to explain what's going on. It does seem like everybody's looking for answers, doesn't it? Uh, well, yeah. Every time, every time something falls or looks like it's going to fall apart, everybody wants to find uh, wants to find out what the causation was. All times and all places, there are far too many factors at work in a real world to provide such an explanation, and no author has even attempted to provide one. That is a uh, from for, I, I've been in the in the financial markets for for ten plus years now. That is uh, that's an incredibly uh, intuitive statement to to, to make. Because the truth is that everyone tries to put a label on it. They try and say it was this or it was that. And, and there's no question that, uh, that all of that contributed to it. It was right. the reduction in China's growth. You know, estimates put China's growth somewhere between 3% and 7%. And we were hearing from the analysts, from the experts for years, that oh, we might see a decline from double digits, but 8% return is what we should expect year over year from China. And you're looking at that now, and you're saying, "Well, that, that's not possible. It, it's there's no way they're running that that high, and they've had a, a what now a 50% decline in their in their equity markets." And you look at this stuff, and you say, "Well, yeah, it could have been China. It can also be 